Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this is a speaker series, a combination map and robotics program. Uh, we've been doing a tech series of our own, and uh, I thought it'd be good if you met a good friend of mine. I've known him since college. This is Patrick Lee. Uh, Patrick uh, has had a very storied life and career. He started out in Maryland. Uh, he's done a lot of extracurricular activities, as you guys are doing. He and I were just talking about we don't do we didn't do half the number of extracurricular activities that you guys did. But he was very involved in martial arts. Uh, the two of us met in, at Berkeley, doing martial arts. Um, Patrick organized a bunch of tournaments, and decided that uh, the group of people that he worked with were so cool that they went to business together. They started about three businesses together, and one of those was Rotten Tomatoes, as you know, is the uh, both the love and the fear of all of Hollywood. If you get a bad tomato score, your movie is probably gonna do horribly. If you get to do a good tomato score and nobody's heard of you, you might actually do pretty well. Uh, Patrick went on from Rotten Tomatoes, actually moved to Hong Kong after that, and uh, started a social media site for uh, called The Live Not Dead for Hong Kong film and uh, recording artists. Uh, so if any of you know Jackie Chan or Jet Li, some of these guys, they were actively part of his website. He's now come out because he's a little tired of China, and uh, he started a couple of businesses out here, and he's going to talk to you. So everybody, give him a round of applause. Um, so our first question is: So when you were in high school, did you do any extracurriculars or anything in school that really got you interested in entrepreneurship? Um, let's see. I I was pretty active in our Chinese school, you know, where you go like on the weekends on Sundays. Um, in the extracurricular stuff there, doing Chinese martial arts, Chinese opera, Chinese dance, that kind of stuff. Um, and also at my school, uh, went to like a math science, computer science magnet program, but then I got involved where we started a Chinese club over there um, and started kind of getting involved with organized people there. And I started realizing like, I like to, organize things, like getting people together and, and doing things. And so that's been something that I've been kind of doing ever since. Uh, so how did you get the idea for the Rotten Tomatoes website in the first place, and why do you think it became so successful? So before Rotten Tomatoes, we had a, a web design firm doing a lot of work for the entertainment industry. So we were doing stuff for Disney Channel, uh, Warner Brothers, ABC, MTV, VH1, a bunch of those kind of companies. And our creative director was actually the one who came up with the idea, uh, this guy, Sandy Duong. And basically his thing was, he was a huge Jackie Chan fan, and there was a movie coming out called Rush Hour, and he wanted to know what everyone, all the critics were saying about it. And so he kind of went out and started gathering the reviews. And back then, um, the reviews weren't online, most of them weren't. So he'd actually go to the library, get like magazines and newspapers, and look it up and like pull out a quote and then write down the quote and then go back and, and make the site. And back then, he wasn't an engineer, he was a career director. So he actually built the stuff, but it was all in static HTML. Um, and then uh, the idea was, you know, like if you open up a, a newspaper, you'll see a full page ad for a movie, and it looks like a poster with a bunch of quotes on it, but all the quotes are always good. It doesn't matter, if the movie's good, then the quotes are like from famous film critics. If the movie's bad, there's still good quotes, but they'll be from like a radio station DJ or something like that. So his idea was just like, well, what if I do the same thing, but only from professional critics and all the quotes, good and bad, and then put a score on it. And that's how it started. And this is, this is I think, before you guys were all born. This was in August 98 when we launched it. So, it's an old site. Um, so, when you were in school, so you started out as a computer science major, right? So what is something that you wish you knew when you first started out? Um, what I wish I knew. I think one thing that I wish I did a better job of was being more proactive as, because for most of the companies I was the CEO, being more proactive about like networking, connecting with people. So I would get people together to do something, but once we were doing it, we'd all be just focused on the product. And um, I wasn't spending enough time, I think, in my opinion, getting out there, trying to meet more, folks that might be able to help us in other ways, like advising us, business partners, investors, et cetera. Um, and that was sort of, should have been part of my job. Um, so that's one thing I, 
I wish I knew as I, I wish I had a little bit better network back then um, because it could have definitely helped to have more advice early on. Uh, so we know that you founded at least six companies or at least helped found six. So what do you usually look for when you're coming up with ideas for a new company? Um, all the companies were just companies I did with friends. They're all from at least one of the co-founders for all six companies was a someone I was friends with from freshman year of college, either through the martial arts program that I was in with, with Kwan, or someone down the floor from me in the dorms. So like Sam who, who created Wild Tomatoes was literally just a couple doors down freshman year. Um, so that was one, and then for me, the other thing I was looking for was just something, doing something together with friends that seemed cool. Um, so of the six, you know, four of them were entertainment related. The design firm, Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, the one I did in Hong Kong was kind of like a MySpace type of thing, working with celebrities and artists uh, in Asia. And then the last one I, I did was uh, mobile gaming. And so a lot of them were just like, what do I like to do, do with friends? They weren't, we weren't really motivated by, hey, this could be a great business and we could make a lot of money, um, which, you know, maybe we should have been a little bit more about that, but uh, it was just more like, I want to do something with friends that I think is cool. Um, could you go into a little detail about each of the six companies that you helped found and like how those came about and then like if they like one another, they were like completely different from each other? Okay. Um, so they're most of them are pretty different. Uh, so the first was selling computer systems and components. Um, so people would uh, place orders, we'd go and call the orders in, uh, got a reseller's license, drive down to you know, like San Jose or Fremont, buy the parts from a distributor or a manufacturer, come back, build a computer, deliver it. Um, what year that, in school were you in? This was in nine, uh, 95, I think. So you were um, a sophomore? I, junior? I think we were finished sophomore, so right before junior year. And um, that wasn't a great business. You didn't really make much money. And um, it, especially back then, if you held inventory, it would, uh, the value of stuff like CPUs and memory would go down really, really fast because they're making things a lot cheaper. So if you held anything, even for a couple weeks, like you would have lost money just on that inventory. Um, and for that one, we just put in our own savings that we had from part-time jobs and stuff, doing it out of our apartment. Um, it made it, but it was a good learning experience of starting a first company. Um, the second one was the design firm. Did it with a different friend. Uh, we started off doing web print design and 3D design and, and quickly realized like print design and 3D design are, are take a lot more processing power. So we said, forget that. We just decided to focus. Things went a lot better when we started focusing because we used to do it for everything. And we said, no, let's just do it for entertainment. And it was more interesting to us, but also it made a lot more sense because our portfolio made sense at that point. Um, and that one, we took a loan from my mom and my co-founder's uncle, total about 30,000. And it was a service-based business, so once you landed a client, you're making money right away. Um, so that one, we did that, and we were able to pay back the loan over the course of like a year and a half or something like that. Then Rotten Tomatoes started when our uh, my creative director came up with the idea. Then we hosted it for about a year, just and as he was still working with us, and he was just doing it for fun on the side. Within that first year, when Pixar came out with the Bugs Life, we saw a spike in traffic. When we looked up the IP, it was coming from Pixar. Um, there's this famous film critic called Roger Ebert. He wrote an article pointing out his favorite movies and Rotten Tomatoes was one of them. And so there's a couple things like that that happened within that first year or after that year we're like, you know, if Roger Ebert's using this, if, if Pixar's using this, there's probably something there. Um, and that's when we decided to go out, start that, raised a million in funding and, and focus all our effort on that, brought the whole team over to focus on that. Uh, afterward, we sold it, I went to China, doing a company there that was like, a little bit like a Yelp, but it also had been like a machine that we would put into, um, into like restaurants and merchants and things like that. That people could get a loyalty card, go in and swipe the card to kind of track their points. But also then merchants could track their transactions to try to like, you know, provide better services for them or discounts for them. Um, we raised 1.3 for that, and uh, but it didn't totally work out because 
what we found out is merchants were happy to take the machines and happy to like offer this service to people and people were happy to get the card, but merchants didn't actually want to swipe it because when they swiped it, one, that's when they would have to pay us for stuff, for the a percentage of their transactions, but also um, they were worried that you know, a lot of stuff is in cash and they didn't want to pay tax on everything. So they were worried if the government ever like grabbed our servers, they would know that these merchants had more transactions than what they were reporting. And so they had this hidden incentive not to swipe. Um, but, uh, and then the fifth one was yes, like a MySpace type of site. It was uh, working with celebrities and artists to connect to each other and to their fans. Um, and we had, we had raised about half a million for that one. Um, Worked with, yeah, we did like the official Jet Li site, Jackie Chan site, this uh, other actor called Daniel Wu was one of the co-founders. Um, so worked with a lot of pretty big artists over there that maybe not as well known over here. Um, and then the last one was a mobile game company. Try to make games for your for your phone, Android and, and iOS. Uh, raised five million on that one. Um, we launched two games, but the metrics didn't really work out. Um, essentially we were making less money per user than it costs to acquire a user. And if that happens, it makes it pretty much impossible to market. Um, so that's, those are all the different ones. And they're all kind of all over the place because it's just, like I said, it's what we thought was interesting and cool. We're like, yeah, that sounds good, let's do it. So what would you say that your leadership philosophy is? Uh, leadership philosophy. Like when you, because you were in charge of, basically in charge of the company, you were running it with your friends, but if you were in the CEO position, like how did you manage everything and make sure that everything was going smoothly and there was nothing happening that you didn't want to know? Um, the main thing was we, we always wanted to have good communication among everyone in the team. The teams were fairly small. Our design firm was like 20 something people. The one in China was bigger, but I didn't really run it like day to day because it was in China. Um, but most of my main teams were sub 10 people, Ron Tomatoes was seven most of the time. When we sold it, it was 10 people. Um, our design firm, our, the mobile gaming company was nine people. You know, the one in Hong Kong was also nine people. Um, so for me, the biggest things with all those was, I tried to run it like a family. Um, because these are people that you're gonna see more than you're gonna see your own family. Actually, this is true of like probably any job you do. Um, and so we really tried to have that, have that feeling um, in a way that we wanted to all support each other uh, have good communication and that's why I wanted to do things that were like with friends that I thought was fun um, because then to me that was like the dream scenario um, versus say a job that maybe pays a lot better but you you hate it and you don't like your coworkers or something like that um so you founded two of those companies while you were in college right and Three. then so you it basically took you 10 about 10 years to finish your college because you doing so many other really great things. Um, can you talk to us a little about, about like how that happened and like if you would recommend ever doing that if mm -hmm. it was like, nope, not ever? Yeah, so uh, it actually took 12 years to graduate. I did two, and then when we did our first company, I convinced three other friends to leave school. I'm like, hey, let's do this together. And they're like, okay, let's do it. And so it took me 10 years to finish the last two years worth of school. I would take you know, I'd go in part-time or I'd take summer classes or when things got really busy with the company, I'd take off like a whole year and then come back. Um, I, I don't recommend it. I think it's actually better just to finish because it's kind of like it's, it's annoying to try to do both at the same time. And, um, and I was, it was more that I was so close to finishing that I'm like, oh, I should just, like after we sold on tomatoes, I went back for one semester, finished all the remaining classes that, and then went to Asia because I didn't know if I was gonna come back. Um, I will say though that in college, I think one of the best things you can get from school is like, college is the single best place to find a co-founder. Um, because it's like people you know, hopefully you're friends with, um, you kind of have a similar background of, of going to the same school together. And um, you know, doing a startup is a lot like, it's like marriage, you know, when you find a co-founder. And some people, they think like, oh, I wanna start a business, I'm just gonna go and ask, go to a tech conference, meet a person, and see, be like, will you be my co-founder? But you wouldn't do that thing normally if you're gonna get married to someone, you, you go on dates, you get to know them. And so it's a lot easier when you're in school, I mean, even potentially high school, that you have good friends that you get along with and you can trust, and then from there you can work together. 
Um, but as far as graduating, I would say if you really want to do something, it's probably better to finish. And if you're really in a rush, take more classes and finish faster, just so you kind of get it out of the way. But at the same time, there are a lot of startups where the people were either in undergrad or grad school and they left to do theirs, you know, like Facebook and Yahoo and Google and a bunch. But I'm not recommending that. Yeah. So do you know that um, you were working with your company around the time when the recession happened? So how did you get through that? Yeah, so we, Rotten Tomatoes started August 98, but we didn't start running it seriously as a business. Like we closed funding in January 2000 because it took us about a year to decide like, hey, we should do this as a business. It took me a couple months to raise money. The, the stock bubble burst in 2000, March of 2000, so two months after we raised, and it was really, really bad. Like I think like 90 something percent of all the internet companies at the time went out of business because it was just, it was so bad that people couldn't raise money, but also most revenue was coming through banner ads. And because no one had money, the people who were buying banner ads were other internet companies. And when they couldn't raise money, they couldn't spend money. And when they can't spend money, no one could make money, right? So it's like, you can't make money and you can't raise funding. It's like, how do you stay in business? So almost everyone went out of business. For us, we had transferred over about 25 people from our startup, from our design firm over to Rotten Tomatoes. And we had to cut to 21, 17, 14, 11, and then seven within a year. Like we told people like, look, we can't support everyone, like please start looking for a job. And we tried to keep them employed until they found something um, so that they wouldn't have a, a gap. And then even when we had seven people, everyone took at least a 30% pay cut and myself and another guy, Paul, a marketing person, we went to zero. And then for me, I actually, the way I went to zero salary was I moved into the office because we had a lot of extra space. We had an office for 20 something people and then suddenly we had seven. And I just took three cubes, took all my stuff out of the apartment put my clothes into the cubes and then slept under my desk for like six months, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, we did what you had to do to survive. Um, so you talk about like raising funds, you raised like almost $5 million for your new company and one point three for another. How do you go about making, like, finding people to donate to you? Um, is it, is it like people you know or is it just like completely so, well, it's not really a donation. I mean, I suppose it is if it goes under, but like in general, they're investing. So they're, they're getting a part of your company when they invest. Um, the initial ones, you know, like the first one was us putting our own money in. The second one was a loan um, from family. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, though, we raised that one because we were raising from our clients from our design firm. So they already knew what we could do. And when we said, hey, we're, we're thinking about doing this and we could show like, hey, people are using it, then we were able to raise from those clients. Um, and then the next couple, I think we're raising a lot based off of the fact that we made Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so yeah, if you can raise off your team or your track record, that's great. If it's, if it's your first time, a lot of times people like their pre-seed funding, their first round of funding will be like friends and family. I don't recommend that if you can avoid it because um, a lot of them are not sophisticated and when things go bad, they don't really realize like, the risks and when you potentially, like most companies don't make it and when you lose their money, it can hurt your relationship with them. Um, and, and I learned that a little bit the hard way because actually my fourth company, some of the money came from family because they were like, they wanted to put in after Rotten Tomatoes and then when it didn't go well, yeah, it did affect relationships a bit. I mean, things are okay now. Um, but in terms of generally, like what I would recommend if you're trying to think about raising money is Get something that works. Like find something that people want. So with Rotten Tomatoes, you know Pixar and Roger Ebert, they were using it before we even went to raise money. So uh, if you can essentially find, they call it like product market fit, it's going to be a lot easier to raise money. And so until then, be very, they call it bootstrappy. Like run really lean, spend as little as possible to kind of show that people want it. And there's ways to do that. Like um, you know, do a, they call it like a minimum viable product, MVP, build like the easiest version to try to show that people want it. Go for the, the lowest hanging fruit, you know, the, what you think is the, is the perfect market for this, try and target it and see if people want it. Sometimes you don't even have to build it, like you can build a, a landing page, buy some Facebook ads, and see if people come to the landing page that describes your product, 
and we'll put an email address in if they're interested. Like that at least can show interest, right? So there's ways to do it, but if you can prove that, there, that people want this, it makes it a lot easier to raise. And I usually recommend for folks to go out, prove it first, then raise, rather than, I have this idea, I'm gonna run around for three to six months trying to raise money on an idea. Um, it's gonna be almost impossible to raise, like 99% of the people are gonna tell you no, and you're gonna probably get demoralized and not ever even try building your product. And it's much better to just try and put it out there and see what happens. So we know that in college you majored in cognitive science. So has, how has that impacted um, the way that you work in your company? Yeah, so I, I started Inks, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. I realized I didn't really like the engineering stuff, so I switched to computer science. And I like computer science, but I realized like I don't like to just be in a lab coding all the time. I wanted to be more like the person that kind of sees the whole thing. Um, eventually, when I majored in cog sci, it was more that I had taken enough classes that that was probably the easiest thing to get a degree in. Um, I haven't actually used cog sci for anything. Um, and I think in college, uh, if you haven't figured out your major, computer science, if you're going to do a tech startup, computer science is super useful. Um, or if you're going to do a hardware thing like engineering, I think it'll be really useful. Um, outside of that, you know, a lot of my friends that have done startups, outside of computer science people, like most of them never use the major for anything. It's more like going there to learn how to learn, find a good co-founder, kind of feel like what it's like to be independent. I mean, again, there are some things, if you're gonna do a biotech thing, then if you majored in like uh, medicine or something, it's good, or, yeah. But there are, are definitely are cases where you just go to like learn and things that you may not use for your job afterwards. Um, yeah. Um, can you talk about what it was like building a brand and then it becomes, that became so well known with Rotten Tomatoes and like what that experience was like and you know, reaching out and having to get to meet with people or any stories? Um, yeah, so for us, uh, we, we grew our traffic mainly through search engine optimization. So we basically try to make a site that, um, where every movie actor or director page, we called it, a, we actually internally called it like a movie package because it wasn't just like one page, it would be like cast crew, filmography, um, photos, forums, all that stuff. And it was almost like a mini website for each different movie actor, director. Um, and we would work to try and get those as high as possible on search engines because that was free traffic. We'd even work with other sites to kind of uh, exchange links and stuff like that. Um, and that would improve our ranking. Uh, so we built the traffic that way. At the same time, the brand kind of kept building. Whatever we did, we always thought about like, how will this affect the brand? Brand traffic or revenue were like, anything we did, we would look at how it would affect those things, but we were very protective of the brand um, because that was really important. And there's, because there's spammy ways to like increase your traffic, but people don't not normally like it if they get some random spam email or something like that. Um, it's been pretty neat to see the effects it has. When we first started and we would go into, uh, down south to Hollywood, to you know, sell an ad campaign or something like that for a movie. When they first heard Rotten Tomatoes back then, they would laugh at us because they were like, what kind of name is that? You know, And sort of now it's like, who's laughing now? You know what I mean? Um, and it's been pretty interesting, especially seeing, you know, more like in the news and stuff, um, Hollywood directors or studios or whatever talking about it or reacting to it. Um, I think the, the single coolest thing for me was right when we were selling it, this was in 2004, um, there was a show, uh, the John Stewart was a daily show, was happening. And um, he was interviewing this guy, Mark Ruffalo, who, you know, the guy who plays the Hulk in Avengers. And back then he had a movie called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And, and so he was asking, he was talking to Mark Ruffalo and then suddenly he, he literally goes, so have you ever heard of Ron Tomatoes to Mark Ruffalo? on The Daily Show, when me and my friend, we, were, we just happened to be watching, and we're just like, what, what did he just say? And, he, and, and John Stewart basically talks for almost a minute explaining Rotten Tomatoes to Mark Ruffalo, who, who had never heard of it at the time. And we were just like freaking out. Like that was actually, 
for me, the coolest thing where I'm like, wow, it's, it's on TV and they're talking about it and it's like a show that people watch and that was really cool. I mean, since then I've seen it on um, movie trailers on TV, like uh, Mission Impossible, they'll be like, oh, it's something on Rotten Tomatoes score or whatever, or they'll be on like um, DVDs or movie posters and that's that's pretty interesting. And there's been a couple times with, yeah, with celebrities, uh, like Josh Hartnett and some different folks like that who who I guess are fans or, or, or hate uh, Rotten Tomatoes and that's always neat to kind of see the reactions to it, so yeah. So how did you come up with the name for your company? Oh, uh, gosh. So most of the names I've, of the companies I've had are are very weird. The first one I think we called it Human Ingenuity. It, it's super cheesy now. At the time we thought it was a good idea. Um, our design firm was called Design Reactor, and we had kind of like a nuclear power plant looking kind of motif. Um, Ron Tomatoes was was Sen's idea. The idea was, you know, if, a, if you're watching like a play, like Shakespeare time, and, and the people suck, right? You throw rotten fruits and vegetables at them. Um, so that was that idea. The one in China, I think the first the first version of it we called the Shaban, which in Chinese means like after work, like off work, and because it was kind of relating to like uh, entertainment and and people going to bars and whatever. And then the one in Hong Kong is called Alive Not Dead, which is also really weird. And the reason why was um, there was this actor, uh, Daniel Wu, who was really big over there, and he wanted to direct a movie. And in that movie, he got a couple other actors, so there's four of them, and they made a boy band. But they didn't make the boy band to be a boy band. They made it because they were actually filming it. They actually went out, made songs, sang the songs, had concerts, made music videos, and toured but they were filming it the whole time and then they basically made a mockumentary out of it uh, called The Heavenly Kings. So that boy band was called Alive and they couldn't get Alive.com for the boy band so they, got, they managed to get Alive Not Dead. And then after they came out with the movie, we decided like, hey, maybe we can do something more with the site um, because they were kind of making a statement about the entertainment industry over there. Like how are these like four 30 something year old guys who, who never sang before make a boy band and people accept them? Um, and so we, we try to make that in a way that um, that we could try to help support the entertainment industry over there. And then the last game company was called Hobo Labs. Um, and that was because me and a different friend, uh, co-founder, for a while we were both kind of in between things and just traveling around a lot. Um, and he used to like to joke that we were just like two hobos, you know, like people without a job that travel. Um, and so when we decided to start, we, we thought it'd be funny to call it Hobo Labs. So, very random names. Um, I have one last question before we move on for, I think we'll have the last few questions, but if you were to give your high school self one piece of advice, um, just about anything in general, um, what would it be? About anything in general? Uh, maybe, maybe don't sell Ron Tomatoes so soon. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been, it would have been better if we held on a little bit longer, uh, a year or two at least. Um, but, but similarly related to that was one thing that I made a big mistake with, with Rotten Tomatoes was because I didn't network, I didn't get out there at all. Um, all three of us, me and my two co-founders were super introverted um, and we just happily worked on the product. We were in Emeryville, so we weren't in Silicon Valley or SF um, and we weren't in uh, LA, even though we were a movie site, right? And so when we had offers, we didn't know like, is this the best offer? Um, how to negotiate the offer, how to get competitive things, like the whole process. Is it the right timing to sell? Um, and the two biggest weaknesses related to that was one, yeah, I didn't have any network at all. And two, I, I was actually very afraid of public speaking. Like anything, even something like this, I would never do. I would come up with excuses not to do it. What I ended up doing for that was I took acting classes, like a couple, a couple different ones, um, a couple times even, not to learn how to act, like I know I would be a terrible actor, but to get over the fear of public speaking because it forced me to get in, you know, it would be like 10 people, but it kept forcing you to get in front of everyone to like improv or read scripts or whatever. Um, and you start getting used to that feeling. And after a while, at first it was just like this crazy fear, and then you start getting used to it a little bit. My analogy I like to use is, is say you're afraid of uh, going on a roller coaster. If I like duct tape you to that roller coaster, and made you ride it like 50 times, you're, you're gonna be less afraid the 50th time than the first time, 
Because like, you're gonna know, like, oh, this poison's gonna go up, this part's gonna go down, and, and I'm gonna live through it, you know, hopefully. Um, so, so that was one, and then on the networking side, I realized the value of that. And so what I've been doing a lot ever since we sold Rotten Tomatoes and I realized like that was something I needed to do, was I was much more proactive about networking. And I kind of came up with my own weird system for doing it. Um, but like organize a group for tech founders, um, it's like 140 founders, it has to be in tech, has to be a founder, has to be pretty successful. So we have like the guys who, like one of the co-founders of PayPal and co-founder of YouTube and all the co-founders of Twitch and Guitar Hero and a bunch of these like pretty good companies um, all together and we organize like, I do like dinners every six to eight weeks with them. You know, I'm, the, I'm doing a, a huge one down in LA with 120 people, like VP, senior VPs from all, like, all these different studios. Uh, a bunch of the director and a lot of the cast from like Crazy Rich Asians and a whole bunch of actors and directors and tech founders like the guy who uh, created like Dollar Shave Club and some of them. So I've been doing a lot more of those kinds of things, more events, getting people together um, because having a good network, even in high school, definitely in college, like it's super valuable to be able to support each other, to give that advice, to find future co-founders or clients or partners or users or any of those things. Um, so yeah, it doesn't hurt to even start early, even now. Like easily you could start a, a company with people you know just from high school. Very good. Um, Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah. on Rotten Tomatoes, and what do you think about them? Um, I think there were some people who were mad about, I, I think it was like Suicide Squad yeah, or sure. something like that, and they're trying to start a boycott, and they were saying Rotten Tomatoes was really biased, but what was funny was at the time, Suicide Squad is a Warner Brothers movie. You know, Warner Brothers owns DC, and at the time Rotten Tomatoes was owned by Warner Brothers, so you would think if they're gonna be biased to anyone, they would've been biased to Marvel movies, not yeah. DC movies. Um, yeah, so I think that was kind of silly. There have been issues where, uh, with Rotten Tomatoes where fans would go in and try to change the user ratings, because there's user ratings and there's critic ratings. The ones you see in the newspaper and everywhere, those are the critic ratings. But users would try to actually like spam Rotten Tomatoes to change the user ratings for things. And they did it, I think, for like Ghostbusters and Star Wars and I think some other ones like that. And I think re recently Rotten Tomatoes just announced, like, I think yesterday, that they're actually changing, they're not gonna allow people to start writing reviews and other things until the movie actually comes out, which makes a lot of sense. Because people normally, maybe like 1% or less, would have actually seen the movie early from a preview or something like that. Um, and so hopefully that can stop people from spamming. Because uh, there are a lot of trolls online. Yeah. Um, since you sold Rotten Tomatoes, what do you do for a living now? So I did three different startups. Um, the thing is, of the six startups, basically five of them kind of either went flat or died. Only one really made it. Um, I think that's pretty normal with startups. Um, so right now, I basically have been taking breaks since around April of last year, traveling, seeing friends and family, uh, speaking um, at like universities or high schools or tech conferences just for fun uh, because I enjoy doing it. And I have started thinking a little bit more about what I'm gonna do next. I'm still figuring it out. I'm thinking it may be more on the advising or investing side, like working with startups, but not necessarily for me to do it. Because um, one thing I realize is with any startup, it takes a lot of time. It can be very, very stressful. Um, and I feel like it's something that's better left to younger folks. And at this point for me, I think it makes a lot more sense for me to advise and help other startups or invest or get other people to invest. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, you, uh, about meetings with other co-founders and you mentioned the co-founder of PayPal. Is that Elon Musk or the other one? Uh, Max Lepchin? Yeah. Neato. Yeah. Elon Musk, I had met him a long time ago but this was pre-PayPal like when he was doing a company called Zip2 and because we used to play games together. There was this game a long time ago called Quake that we played together. But I totally lost, lost contact with him because um, after, 
I sold Rotten Tomatoes and I went to Asia. Um, still kind of in touch for a little bit, and then I remember my last email to him, I had sent him some email and he wrote back to me, he was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm using a new email address, it's like something something at spacex.com. And I was like, what's a SpaceX? And I mean, now he's like, yeah, he's, he's definitely done some amazing things since then. But back then, the circle was quite small. Imagine that different CEOs are different. Like everyone is their own, does things their own way. And I also think it's probably pretty different between corporate and, and startup, and also depending on the size of the startup, the size of the, the corporate company or whatever. Um, at least for me, and I think, well, I'm not sure if it's the same for everyone. A lot of people are more approachable than you would expect, I think. Like, you'd be surprised if you just, someone on LinkedIn or something like that, that sometimes they'll respond. You know, I've tried this a couple times. Even when we were first starting, we were trying to reach out to people, like cold calling, whatever, and like, especially if you're not trying to sell them something. Um, yeah, I mean, you never know. I mean, like Elon Musk might be pretty hard to reach, but there are ones at that. If you went on like LinkedIn and you wrote a really nice message to them, um, saying you're at high school and you're working the same, and, you know, speaker or whatever, I bet if you tried 20, you'd probably get a couple of responses. Like, yeah, and it, again, you never know until you actually try. Right? Uh, how important do you think like the name and logo is for like a company like that? Um, I, I think it helps, but you can always change the name if once it's going well. It's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, wasn't Facebook called like the Facebook or something before? Yeah, I mean, um, of course, having a good name is something is great, but the main thing is to find out if people want it. And so a lot of people will waste time when they first do a startup, like spending a ton of time on the name and the logo and like spending too much time researching and filing a patent. And you know, a lot of stuff that's, it's, it, it is important, the legal stuff, the finance, like let me get an office, let's, let's get a good sign, but it's not actually, and none of that is actually helping you figure out if people want it. And really the most important thing is, is it find out if they want it, and when they do, then you can raise money, then you can do all the other stuff that's like important, but not the, the most important thing. So that falls into the not that important. You can change the name, you know. I mean, even if you got pretty big, just rebrand if you have to. Yeah, I'll be around for a little bit. Yeah. Thanks.